Good morning and welcome to Tracyton United Methodist Church. Today is a beautiful day. I hope you're enjoying the lovely weather that we are having. And today we're going to be talking about our final sermon on unless the Lord builds the house with one caveat. I'm changing the word house to home. Unless the Lord builds a home, the labors labor in vain. So let's enjoy God's presence. Let's worship in spirit and in truth as we worship God today. Amen. Our gathering prayer this morning. Let us pray. Almighty God, we gather wherever we are this final week of Easter tide in celebration of living the resurrection with the resurrected one at our side. We know but need assurance that we are not alone that we continue to journey with the one who calls us and the one who saves us, even as we look forward to the one who will empower us to continue the work of building toward the kingdom of God. Each service, we are reminded that our experience of worship is about a relationship with Christ and with one another, and it is about glory, receiving glory and giving glory. We are called to recognize the glory of Christ in the world today it is experienced in moments of service and support. We give glory when we bind up the broken. We bask in glory when we feed the hungry. We see glory when we reach out to heal hurting hearts. We praise and thank Jesus for inviting us to know God's glory in our own lives as he knew it in his. We bend our hearts and listen for your word. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. And now our prayer of illumination, Lord, open our hearts and our minds, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first reading is from Acts 1, 1 through 11. In the first book, Philippus wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during the forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized me with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they had asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set for his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, and all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and in the cloud, and took them out of their sight. While he was going, he, they were gazing up towards heaven. Suddenly two men in white robes stood be beside him. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking towards the heavens? This Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in some way as you saw him go into heaven. The word of the Lord. Our next reading is from Psalm 47 and Psalm 93. Clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with holy, loud songs of joy. For the Lord the Most High is awesome and great king over the earth. He subdued his people under the nations, under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves, Selah. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord of the sounds of the trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with song. God is King of all the nations, God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. 
The Lord is king. He robed is in, in majesty. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He is girded with strength. He has established the world. He it is never shall be moved. Your throne is established from old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up. O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice. The floods have lifted up their roaring. More majestic than the thunder, thunders of the mighty waters, more majestic than the waves of the sea. Majestic on high is the Lord. Your decree is very sure. Holiness benefits your house, O Lord, forevermore. And a reading from Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Je Jesus and your love toward all the saints. For, and for this I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what the hope of which he has called to you, what riches of greatness, glorious inheritance among his saints, and what is the immeasurable, immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put his power to work in Jesus Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him on the right hand of the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only, that is, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And this has been put to all things. Under to his feet he has made them head over things of the church, which is his body, and the fulfillment of him who fills in all. The word of the Lord. Glory Patre. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, and now shall ever be, world without end. Amen. As some of you know, next uh, Sunday we're reopening the church, so we have situated the sanctuary as if uh, uh, in-person worship is already occurring. I'm excited about this, and I hope you are, and I hope you plan on attending uh, next Sunday at 10 o'clock. Now I'm going to ask the congregation to stand as you normally would, even though there's only a few of us here this Sunday, but we might as well get back into the rhythm of the way we do things. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the Law of Moses and the Prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand Scripture. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my father has promised. So stay here in the city until you are endued or been clothed with power from on high. The gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. So we are preparing for Pentecost, which is next Sunday. So the opening of the church is appropriate that were reopening the church on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit was poured out upon the disciples in the upper room and they bore witness that many people were added to the kingdom of God on that day. And thus many look at Pentecost as the birth of the church. Well, guess what? Next Sunday is the rebirth of our church. The Spirit is being poured out upon us. We are preparing for the coming of the Spirit. But what I want to talk about this morning 
is about the continuation of how do we build the church? How do we build this church? So I'm going to use a baseball diamond. So I think I can do this now. I think I can come around and walk around like I used to do when we had a full house. So I'm, I'm, I'm practicing now, getting used to all the people that are going to be gathered here next week. So I'm going to, I'm going to liken uh, building a church to a baseball diamond. For those who know about baseball, you have first base, you have second base, and you have third base, and then you have home. The idea in baseball is you want to advance the runner so that they can come home. So the idea of building a church is to advance people so that they can come home. See the, see the point? So in, in baseball, there are rules of the game. You can't apply games of football or golf or gardening or whatever to the game of baseball. It has its own rules, and they have to follow those rules. And they have an umpire that calls the strikes out, safe. So you have an umpire. So you have someone that's, uh, you understand the game, the, the rules of the game. You play by the rules. And if you play by the rules, you advance people around the bases and they finally come home. Well, there are rules of the game for the church. The main rule, as you all know, is to love God with all your heart, soul, body, and mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the main rule. We, we all, everything else follows and is birthed out of those main rules to advance people. So I want to take a look at these rules of the game as it applies to first base, second base, and third base. So, in order for God to build the church, he has to do something in each of us. And these are the rules. God, in order to build a whole, the church as a whole, where there's hospitality and welcoming for all who gather, and what are the rules that we follow? There are rules for first base, second base, third base. If we follow those rules, we will arrive at our destination whole for everyone. So the first rule at first base is God has to do something in each of us. I call this the transformation of us personally. We all must go through a transformation of sorts. So how do we experience this transformation? We experience this transformation, I think, essentially when we are able to connect our story from the time I was born up until the moment I'm living to this day, I have lived out my, my story that has been imprinted by, by my parents, by my education, by the friends that I have, and the, the life's the current the events of my life it becomes my story. But somehow I have to learn to connect that story, my story, to the gospel story. And so I, I need to know the gospel. And that's what Jesus did for the disciples. See, they all each had their story. But then he opened their minds to understand the scripture that revealed everything about Jesus in the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. It reveals, God reveals Jesus. Jesus reveals God. And we learn that story. And as we learn that story, then we're invited to somehow connect our story to the gospel story. And when we're able to make that connection to the gospel story, transformation happens because I have now a new narrative. I have a new story to tell. I have a new story to tell. It's like Paul, when Paul said, we are a new creation. And that new creation is because my mind has been opened to understand the scriptures. But here's the problem. One of the problems is that we try to reduce the gospel story to our own story. We try to reduce the gospel story so that it fits and complies with our story. There's no transformation. None. You're just going to live life ho-hum, 
day in and day out. And you're going to wonder, where is God? Where is God? Where is God? Because you fail to connect your story to the gospel story. In order to connect your story to the gospel story, God has to open our minds to understand the scriptures. Well, how is God going to open up our minds? That's what Pentecost is all about. I will pour out my spirit upon you and on your mind and in your heart. I will write my law. My law, or the rules of the game, is simple. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Living it is the hard part. Understanding it, we can get it. But living it is the hard part. And so we need the power of the Spirit to help us live. That's what, that's what the Acts reading is about. You shall receive power when the Spirit comes upon you. And as you receive that power, you will be my witnesses. What is a witness? You simply tell your story. And if it's connected to the gospel story, it's a new narrative that somehow reveals who God is for you. God works to change our hearts and minds by the word of truth. Not our interpretation, not our projection, not like we would think it is, but we are open to the possibility that God's word is true. And if we abide in the word, we will know the truth. And the truth will set us free from what? He will set us free from the false narrative. He will set us free from the lie. Oh, I'm not good enough for God. I'm not worthy to be a Christian. Blah, 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 blah. Stop. Listen to what the Spirit is saying through Christ in the Word. And as you embrace that reality, you embrace the notion that you are beloved of God. You are beloved of God. Act like you're beloved of God. Treat others as though they were a beloved of God. Whether they are or not is not your business. Your business is to treat everyone as if they are beloved of God. That's how that works. That's the rule. So I call this a personal, spiritual, an ethical transformation according to word, the word of God, the word of truth, and the power of the spirit that enables you to live that new life, to live that new narrative. Personal, spiritual, and ethic according to the word of God. Not my ethic, not those ethics, but God's ethic based on love. Then that's first base. So now we've, we've arrived at first base. We're now, okay, we got it. We're ready. To, wait a minute. You're not ready for home yet. You got to go to second base. Okay, so what are the rules of second base? The rules of second base is what I call God with us. So in the first base, God is in us and working to transform our lives. On second base is a little more difficult because God is with us, which means plural, that means community. So my spiritual, my personal spirituality is not enough. It has to be connected to the community spirituality, what we call the church. So now I am called to be in communion with other people. I might not even like them. They don't think the way I think. They don't look the way I look. They may not have the same color that I am. They might not have the same kind of hair. Oh, they may not even be sexually, their sexual orientation is different than mine. Beloved of God. Beloved of God. Treat everyone as beloved of God. So what are the rules of God with us, transforming, basically transforming the church. So the church, every church, every local church, I don't care if you're Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic, 
Every local church has what I call a spiritual DNA. The spiritual DNA is the makeup of all the people in that community. And they have a kind of spiritual DNA. The way it gets played out is in our customs, our traditions with a small T. You'll hear a lot of times, we always do it this way. I remember one of the churches, first church, well, one of the churches I was called to serve, uh, they did communion by kneeling. So the idea was people would come up to the altar and the clergy would distribute the bread and they go back and get the cup and distribute the cup. And so I, I was told that. So I did it. About the second or third week, I, I, I realized there's a scuttle what's going on out there. What's going on? No one wants to talk to me. I finally found out. Well, the minister always starts at this end and goes that way. Never from that end to this way. See, that's their spiritual DNA. They became accustomed to that. So I honored that. I simply went in this direction and everything was fine. So that's, that's kind of like a, a spiritual DNA of the community. Sometimes you have to figure that out. Sometimes you have to recognize that and honor that. But other times, in order for the church to be transformed, so that the spiritual day, DNA is such that little subtle things like, for example, years ago I was visiting my son up here in Seattle, he lived over in Seattle Ballard area, and they were looking for a church, and I saw this beautiful United Methodist Church right down the road. It was, you know, had one of those where you climbed up the stairs, had columns and all that, and it looked like a glorious building, and I thought, Scott, why aren't you going to this church? And he just looked at me and says, Pop, he says, do me a favor. You go visit that church one Sunday. After you visit the church, we'll sit down and talk about it. Okay. So I thought, this is great. I've always loved walking the church. I, you know, hear the bells ring, you know, walk the church. When Ann and I first got married, we walked the church because it was a neighborhood church. And this church was in the neighborhood. And I woke up and I left at 9.45. I think I can be there in five minutes. I walked over there and I'm climbing up the stairs. It's now about five minutes to 10. The service is 10 o'clock on the marquee. And I tried to open the door and it was locked. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. And I thought, well, maybe they had a community picnic and they just didn't tell anybody about it. So I thought, well, gee, I'm, I'm sorry I missed it. So I'm, I'm walking down the stairs and, and I'm walking along the road. There's a little alleyway and I look down the alleyway and I saw people going in the side door into the church. So I walked down there and I said, uh, hey, uh, do you know your front doors are locked? And he said, everybody knows the front doors are locked. You're going through this door. And I said, well, excuse me. I'm not everybody, but I didn't know that. And it was like I did something wrong. It's like it's my fault that I didn't go through the door. Well, that's a kind of signal that I would, if I were a clergy and I got more curious, so I went ahead and went in. But if I were just the average show, just trying to find a church. I said, well, they don't want me in this church because, you know, they just assume that I should know everything that's going on in this church. I'm not one of them, and I don't want to be one of them. So there's a certain spiritual DNA that has to be transformed. And most of us are unaware of what transformation needs to take place because we assume, well, everybody knows. No, I have news for you. Not everybody knows. One of the transformations that has to take place is to understand diversity in a new life. Diversity, unity does not mean that all diverse people come together and conform to this idea of what it means to unify. That's not, that's not celebrating diversity. Unity actually is a composite or the, the, the assimilation of all the diversity because if you're trying to conform people to what you think unity is, well, if your spiritual DNA is white supremacy, that's what you're going to be looking for. And if you don't conform to that, then you're not accepted in this church. Now, that's an extreme. I understand that. But every church has a spiritual DNA that has to be honored, 
and also it has to be transformed. So you have to figure out what part of our spiritual DNA has to be transformed. The part is simply this, that when new people come, the DNA changes. And you have to allow for that change because new people are participating. If you do not allow that for that change and you're looking for conformity instead, you will chase them away. You will never build a church. You will never build a home of hospitality and welcoming. Rather, it'll be conformity and people will not conform. They'll be transformed, but not conform. So we have to understand that the, the celebration of unity is the celebration of our diversity. And the more diverse that we are, the better chances we will, will grow. So the more uh, opportunity for people of different color, people of different backgrounds, different ethnicities, coming together to celebrate the power and presence of Christ, the better chance you have of growing a church. And one of the most excluded communities in this country right now are the gay lesbian community. Just what would happen if we opened our doors, really opened our doors, and allowed them to be a part of the composite of the spiritual DNA of the church? See, we might welcome them, but don't change us. Or we might welcome them, we just don't talk about it. Keep your, keep your sexual orientation private to yourself. Don't share that. That's, that's their story. Maybe their story, by connecting the gospel story, is God made me this way, and I am I'm beloved of God. That's my story. But if we squelch it, then that story is not being heard. And others will not hear it. So the rules of second base is we are transformed when we understand that the sacrament of communion, we are becoming what we are consuming, the cosmic Christ, which is diversity, because on the day of Pentecost, you remember, people from all over the world, of that known world at that time, gathered together with all the different languages, and when the disciples spoke, they understood what they were saying. So a lot of people think, oh, the gift is that they, they, they were able to speak in tongues that could be understood. Maybe, maybe the miracle was in the hearing. They spoke their mother language, but people were able to hear them that had different languages. So maybe it's a, it's a different way of understanding the miracle. So here's one of the important things, and this is probably the more difficult part of the second stage, is when you do not have clear boundaries, policies, and procedures, this will eventually be to disunity. Why? Because you don't have a clear rule, and you don't have a clear umpire to make the call. Now, we have a church structure that helps us do that, but one of the problems is we're not very clear about everything that we are doing, and no one seems to know what's going on, so there's a little bit of frustration, because we, what happens is when you don't have clear understanding of the DNA, then you create a power vacuum. And when you create a power vacuum, then People of goodwill, don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about bad people, I'm talking about people of goodwill will step into those places and try to do what they think is best, but it isn't according to the DNA of the church and it causes disruption. So there has to be a clear boundary, clear rules from the customs of the church. Like we've gone through this COVID thing We've taken our cue from our bishop and our district superintendent to help us navigate our, our way through this uh, COVID experience. Uh, and then we come up with our own set of thinking and rules that we need to be clear about so people know. And then they'll generally feel okay with that. It's that when you take them by surprise, like, you know, someone were to came in and come in and, 
and you say, you can't come here because we don't, we don't know if you've been vaccinated or something like that. People get upset. People get hurt feelings that way. And unfortunately, they walk away in a broken relationship. So we need to be clear about what it is and who we are. We have to have a clear communication. That's what community means. It's not just this idea of me and Jesus, but I'm in communion with my brothers and sisters in the body, and in order to have clear communion with people, I have to have communication. If I have communication, i got to be listening. I have to hear, not just speak. I need to hear what's going on. And whenever there's no clear guidelines, then people get hurt. In order to build the church, we need God to transform us from I to we are. You know what I'm saying? I can't just say, everybody knows what to do, because I am speaking, but rather, what is it that the we gather together? What are we saying? And is it inclusive? Is it engaging? Is it hospitality, generous, those sorts of things. So I call this communal spirituality and ethics. So we have personal spirituality and ethics. Now we have communal spiritual, spirituality and ethics according to word and sacrament. So word and spirit, word and sacrament. Why? Because that's what binds us together. I, I have to, a little sidebar, and I'll probably quit with this. I'll get to point three next week. A little sidebar. Um, and, 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 and you know, I don't mean to, you know, I want to try to navigate this, but it does bring the point home, which I thought was very strange at the time. So this particular church in which this gay lesbian issue started to emerge, and it turned out that one of the members of the choir uh, came out of the closet, and he was male. And all the guys were on this side, and the following Sunday, all the guys were on this side, were over here, and all the, he was by himself over there. So when I saw this, I went to the guys, and I, not that I confronted them in a direct way, but I brought this to their attention. And of course they used language like, oh, I love the, I love the sinner, but I hate the sin, all that stuff. And I said, well, do you have a problem with him coming to communion? They said, no. I said, if he bowed down on the rail, would you bow next to him and say, oh, yes, I would. I said, do you see the contradiction here? Do you see what's going on here? If you, have, if you value this as a sacrament, then it has to impact where you stand with this person. And then I was able to teach them what I call a sort of a catechesis. I was able to teach them a little bit, sort of a... Uh, teaching moment, if you will. And the following Sunday, they were all back together again. Because if you cannot take communion, if you can take communion together, that's the most intimate, most valuable experience that the body has. That means you are unified. And I told these, this group, I said, if you cannot stand with them, then you should not take communion. Because you're not in communion with them. So it's not just me and Jesus. It's I'm in communion with my brothers and sisters, the beloved of God. And every man, woman, and child that dares to come through that door, we need to see, the first thing we need to see, beloved child of God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we looked at what it means for you to do something in us and what it means for you to do something through us. Next, we will look at God. You want to do something through us. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, it occurred to me that it's appropriate to pause uh, between second base and third base. It does take longer, you know, to get from second base to third base. You want to know why? There's a short stop. So just look at this as a short stop. We'll pick this up next Sunday.
So today we're going to be doing uh, Holy Communion. So if you have your elements at home, make sure you have your bed and, and your cup. Today, I, I made a mistake yesterday. I, I didn't follow the exact guideline. So today, when those who are present here, uh, you, you, you do not have to come up and take the communion at the time. But at the end of the service, you can pick up your communion cup and take it out. You can take it outside or you can take it home. But they don't want us doing it in, in the building. Sorry about that. So I'm learning as we go along as well. Prayer of confession. Let us pray. Gentle shepherd, we are reluctant to look at our own failings. Invited to witness to God's loving forgiveness of sins, we would rather not speak aloud of our own. Let us trust in the one who offers us hope and healing. Help us to proclaim the gospel through, though we find it hard to practice. Forgive us, God of life. Fill us with the glory of your spirit. Help us to stay on the path of righteousness through the love of your Son, our Redeemer, Jesus. Amen. The path, the, the Lord is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Let us change our hearts and minds and turn to the Lord who loves us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Now, as a forgiven and reconciled people, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God. So I'm going to symbolically take the offering plate that we normally pass, which we will start that next week, and we place our offerings within the plate, and then we give thanks to God and our offering. The difference between a communion table and an altar table is that this is sacrifice. The sacrifice of the people. And the sacrifice is based on gift, not suffering, not punishment, but gift. That's the sacrifice. And the table is the fellowship where we break the bread. Let's pray. God of immeasurable love, accept these tithes and offerings from your children. We ask you to multiply uh, and reach and the fruit, fruit, fruitfulness of our the widow's life. May every gift reach someone who is in need or who suffers, who will be alone in this lonely world. We ask that you pour out your amazing grace upon us in the name of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right, good, and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to Almighty God, the Creator of heaven and earth. And just take a look behind me and enjoy God's creation. In the same manner He created you and me, in the same manner. He created His Son, Jesus Christ, in the same manner. He blesses us with bread and with wine and juice. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name, enjoying their unending hymn sayings. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and gave thanks to you. He broke the bread and gave the bread to his disciples and said, Take all of you, eat. This is my body, which is given up for you. In the same manner, he took the cup and gave thanks to you. And he blessed the cup and gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take all of you, eat, drink from this, for this is the cup of salvation, the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in memory of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus, we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, a gift. We offer our gift of ourselves. 
in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Hosanna in the highest. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, gathered and those at home and on this bread and this wine. May all of us become the body and blood of Christ, that we might be the body of Christ to give witness to these things to all people within our influence. Amen. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one together in ministry to the entire world. Through your Son, Jesus, in the Spirit, in your church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And now with the confidence of the children of God, we are bold to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are they who are called to his table. Lord, we are not worthy to receive you. Only say the word and we shall be healed. O Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. O Lamb of God, that takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us thy peace. And now may the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds. This is the time. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Open us to receive the spirit of truth. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We have a few prayers this morning. Uh, I wanted to read a note to you. I didn't, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't bring it. But we've been praying uh, for this Mike back in, in, uh, in Indiana. And he wrote me a lovely card this week. And I'll, I'll read it next week. Um, it's a very lovely card. Thanking the church for the prayers. He, is, he has uh, regained about 10 pounds. He's got more energy. He is living life, a blessed life, and he, he, he's, he's grateful and has gratitude for all the people that have prayed for him throughout the country. And he said, I know that your prayers have worked because I am on the road to recovery. That's essentially what he said in his, his card, but I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you next week. We also want to uh, pray for a friend of a church member that has uh, mental health issues and a dear, when a dear friend died, she, she disappeared. So please pray for the safety. Please pray for a parishioner. She has health needs in order to move forward with a procedure. Other prayers that you may have, yes. Um, there's a few prayers. There's a prayers to a church member who is no longer eating or drinking. It looks like she's... Can you say that again? She's no longer eating or drinking. Okay. So it looks like she's at the end. Okay. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. There's also a church member who has an infection. She's optimistic about it, but prayers to her as well. Okay, okay. So a member who has some kind of infection. So, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And then another person put in the chat, uh, uh, for a person who is pregnant, a family member has diabetes, they're hoping all goes well. Okay, so a per, uh, pregnant woman with diabetes, we pray for her. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Thank you, Lord, for uh, the prayers of your people. You hear us. You care for us. You are there with us. So send your spirit upon each of us in this time of need as we give you praise and thanks for all good things. In Christ's name, amen. Now, I do have uh, someone that we want to remember, not remember, but to celebrate. So, Dodd, would you please come here? So this is a certificate. Now we're going to start doing this, you know, in person now. So since we're Don is here, so this is a certificate of excellence for your good work with trustee. Don is a builder. I, I am envious of this man because he puts his hands on things and he builds things. And I look at those, and, he, and it's just amazing that these things still stand. You know, I I think of myself. I have words. You know, words, maybe it'll build people maybe, but God got a gift and I'm grateful. Here's a card of gratitude. And thank you for all your work with the trustees and our friendship has been very, very meaningful for me. Thank you, my brother. You're welcome. Please come back. We've both been vaccinated, so we can do that. We encourage, we encourage everyone to get your vaccination as soon as possible uh, so that we can at some point, not only for our church, but just as a society as a whole, we can get back to a more normal way of living, traveling, being with family, you know, picnics and being in public and not worrying about issues of death and dying. So hopefully you'll get your vaccination as soon as you can do that, the sooner that you can come to church and we'll all feel safe about that. Now, May the peace of Christ be with you. May the blessings of God Almighty abide with you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just a quick reminder, at 11 o'clock we will have a Zoom meeting, uh, after both Zoom meeting. So please tune in and uh, we'll share the good things of Christ. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. From my heart to your heart, may you be peace.